Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being with us. I'm going to speak into this mic, and I urge all my colleagues to do the same so it can be picked up by C-SPAN and uh, by all of you in the audience. It's great to be back in Princeton. I logged 30 years here almost uh, as a professor, a Senate director, and a dean, and it's always wonderful to come back to this great institution and to find the Woodrow Wilson School in such terrific hands. That pleases me a lot. Um, I'm also very privileged to moderate this panel devoted to Governor Stevenson and specifically to celebrate the book ed edited by Judge Alvin Liebling, which is this book, uh, Adlai Stevenson's Lasting Legacy. I myself, I think, became conscious of national <coughs> politics uh, through those uh, two campaigns that Governor Stevenson uh, contended for the presidency. Um, while Dean Slaughter mentioned one of Governor Stevenson's connections, his Princeton one. He also has a Northwestern connection. He's a Northwestern uh, law degree. Uh, and uh, we're very um, honored by that connection as well. So uh, the book that we celebrate, I think, um, says a lot. I'm not going to talk much about it. But uh, it uh, does put a lot of contemporary issues in the context of Governor Stevenson's life and uh, <coughs> looks at the issues he was engaged in and makes them very relevant to the present issues of our own time. Uh, I will be introducing Judge Liebling, another Northwestern alum, both undergraduate and law, in a moment. And we have a complicated arrangement. But I do want to um, uh, just note for myself that the qualities, the personal qualities, we associate with Governor Stevenson as a public servant in Illinois, uh, at the United Nations as a presidential candidate um, haven't always been in huge supply uh, over the years in American national politics or even in Illinois. Um, but they are the qualities of clear thinking, absence of cant, great wit, human decency, and huge and broad vision in public affairs. And as I said a moment ago, uh, this book elucidates many of the policy issues that Governor Stevenson thought about and framed uh, responses to. And those, uh, the way he framed those issues and his own life, uh, leave us a great legacy indeed for thinking about the role of international institutions, nuclear weapons, diplomacy, and force. I will leave that to the panelists to discuss. I want to say a little bit just on the ground rules will be Working under, you're looking at this dauntingly large panel. I'm going to be rather ruthless uh, as to how many minutes each person uh, has, six or seven, or <coughs> will be here until tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm going to uh, note at the end, as I will say at the beginning, that there will be a reception afterwards and a book signing uh, of the Lasting Legacy uh, book. And uh, when it comes time for Questions uh, from the audience, would you please come to the standing mics so that we can get that uh, in as well. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, introduce Ed Elmendorf, who is Governor Stevenson's assistant, and then uh, Judge Liebling, and then uh, I will, uh, after that, give a very brief bio of each of the speakers, uh, and we'll let them speak. So. Uh, Mr. Elmendorf uh, himself uh, worked as a um, secondary school teacher in Ghana. He was employed at the UN and the World Bank. And in the bank, uh, he led units responsible for the bank country programming and development policy in a number of African countries and Indian Ocean countries. And he served as the lead health specialist in the African uh, region. Uh, following his retirement from the bank in 2000, Mr. Elmendorf served as a professor, uh, professorial lecturer at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies uh, and has continued to be involved in public health issues. He concern, uh, currently consults for the World Bank uh, Institute. Uh, he had very close uh, relationships at one point with Governor Stevenson. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Elmendorf, and then I'll come back to Judge Liebling, as I said, and also introduce the panel. Mr. Elmendorf. Uh, thank, thanks very much. Uh, uh, not long after I started working as Adelaide Stevenson's assistant at the U.S. Mission to the U.N., in May of 1965, the U.N. Security Council had held more meetings than it had ever held previously in any single month. 
The issues, the slide of Vietnam into disorder and the growing U.S. troop presence there, and the landing of American soldiers in the, in the Dominican Republic to quell unrest in that country, put the U.S. on the defensive and were heartbreaking to many. The Council met 14 times that May on the situation in the Dominican Republic. Two months later, Stevenson collapsed on the street in London and died of a heart attack. Looking back and asking myself what Stevenson would see in the United Nations today from his time as a national leader, I offer several points that for me represent Stevenson's lessons for the 21st century. First, speak truth to power, picking up a little on what you were saying before. The power, respect the power of truth and be ever cautious of using power for truth. During the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, Stevenson brilliantly spoke truth to power in demanding answers from the Soviet Union Zorin after showing the Security Council photographs of missile sites. More recently, Secretary of State Colin Powell was misled into telling untruths to the Security Council in the build-up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq, and President Bush spoke of the irrelevance of the United Nations as the Council failed to endorse the planned invasion, using power to try to establish truth. Second, despite its alleged irrelevance, the UN action on Iraq has been sound. The US claimed the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq as a reason to invade. The UN's International Atomic Energy Agency and the Iraq Weapons Inspection Mission, sponsored by the Council, had not found any, but were not permitted to complete their work. Despite massive diplomatic effort, the U.S. was unable to win sufficient Security Council support for a resolution endorsing an invasion. It was never put to a vote, and President Bush ordered U.S. troops to invade without that legitimacy. Subsequent, much more detailed inspection under U.S. leadership revealed no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, so the Council's refusal to endorse invasion was entirely appropriate. Third, a high level of UN performance is possible, as we see in the now more than 100,000 UN peacekeepers in 17 missions around the world and in its humanitarian activities after natural and civil disasters. The capacity for such performance is at risk, however, as the operations expand. In the medium term, this capacity depends on much needed actions of strengthening and reform. Our leaders and leaders around the world need to support funding and other changes that make this stronger performance increasingly possible. The international community needs to reconcile the unparalleled legitimizing power of the UN General Assembly with the small size, veto, and authority to mount peacekeeping missions of a Security Council at risk of losing its legitimacy as it less and less reflects the realities of political, economic, and military power in the 21st century. This is indeed a challenge of Stevensonian scope. Fourth, despite the growing importance for the UN of civil society and instantaneous communication around the world, the UN is and can be only a tool of its member states including the U.S. U.S. leadership is essential to make the U.N. an ever greater institution. Adlai Stevenson saw this. But continuity, consistency, and clarity of vision are critical. The U.S. cannot afford a posture towards the U.N. of public derision one day and expect a high level of delicate performance the next. Fifth, we are arriving at a pivotal moment in American policy and politics with new opportunities for international cooperation and strengthening of international institutions, as we see from Iraq and Afghanistan to the financial markets. This calls for a spirit of leadership and creativity unseen since the years immediately after World War II. With the creation of the UN and its agencies, the Bretton Woods institutions, and NATO, may our leaders act in Stevensonian spirit and seize the day. Let me conclude with a couple of words about Al Liebling's book. In the chapter by former Senator Stevenson with us today, we read that his dad regretted having but one law firm to give to his country. In New York City at the UN, 
confronted by endless rounds of diplomatic luncheons and dinners, Stevenson spoke of his regret to have only one stomach to give to his country. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Almondorn. That was a very well-known law firm indeed. That he. Um, now I'm going to uh, introduce Judge Alvin uh, Liebling, a senior U.S. administrative law judge and editor and co-author <coughs> of Adlai Stevenson's Lasting Legacy. Uh, judge Liebling was chairman of the college student campaign for uh, Stevenson when he was running for governor in 1948. He is also a graduate of Northwestern's Law School, as I mentioned. Judge Liebling served over his career as an assistant attorney general in Illinois, a special attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice, and assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago. He was also acting regional counsel for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in Chicago. Uh, he remains very active in Illinois and in Chicago with legal matters, environmental issues, transportation issues, and I now turn it over to Judge Liebling. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Beaton, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, I wish you thank, to thank you for, for coming, all of you, uh, to Dean Slaughter and former Acting Dean McCarty for inviting us, and uh, NYU President Emeritus John Bradmus for having initiated this symposium. I am grateful to President Henry Beaton of Northwestern University, my alma mater, as he's reminded you, uh, who agreed to act as moderator here today. Dr. Beenan, as has been pointed out, was formerly dean of this great institution, bearing the name of the president who ushered in the predecessor to the present United Nations, to which, through one of its most revered founders and ambassadors, Adlai Stevenson, we give honor today. Stevenson graduated from Princeton in 1922 and from Northwestern Law School in 1928. His uh, treasured friend and colleague, who has recently passed away, and a great friend of all of us, and certainly mine, while at the UN between 1961 and 65, Assistant Secretary of State Harlan Cleveland also graduated from here in 1938. The symposium here today commemorates the publication late last year by New York publisher Paul Grave McMillan, a division of uh, St. Martin's Press, of the book Adlai Stevenson's Lasting Legacy, which I was privileged by his former uh, son, uh, by his son, former Senator Adlai Stevenson III, <laughs> and he still <laughs> remains. <laughs> It was uh, just a flip uh, to uh, edit and contribute some parts to it and to assemble the chapters. We are uh, pleased that Paul Graves' new editorial director, Farida Kuhi Kamili, a graduate of Oxford, has joined us today. Perhaps you'd like to stand and so we know who you are and where you are. Okay, she's waving. Uh, a book signing. We'll follow the program as uh, <coughs> Dr. Bre uh, Dr. Uh, Beenan has uh, indicated. Now, our purpose here today is to speak of the impact today of the good works of a compatriot, former governor and U.S. ambassador to the U U.N., Adlai Stevenson, on the eve of an election capable of bringing some uh, constructive change to our country and hope to others. A return to patient international collaboration and consensus building through the means created for that purpose would indeed be welcome news to the world. And I think that says it in a capsule. Adlai Stevenson was Illinois' 33rd governor, twice Democratic Party nominee for U.S. president, and a revered founder and later U.S. permanent representative to the United Nations inclusive of the period of the Cuban Missile Crisis, respecting which he played a key role in resolving. The book we uh, fittingly celebrate here consists of a dozen interrelated chapters by statesmen, scientists, 
and compatriots who worked and served with Stevenson during his long historic public career from the 1930s until the 1960s. Included are five of the panelists here today, uh, long time, uh, but exclusive of long time Foreign Service uh, Officer and uh, Stevenson admirer Jack uh, Matlock and uh, Edward Elmendorf, who uh, assisted Stevenson as he's mentioned. Dr. Adele Simmons on my right and Dr. Ken Heckler, another author, have both, both been part of the administration and teaching staff here at Princeton. Both Stevenson and Cleveland have contributed their papers to the MUD transcript library here. The Princeton connection is obviously substantial. I express my appreciation to all of the participants in this uh, seminal event, to all who joined in the assemblage of the essays for this great book, and to the university's archivist, Daniel Link, for the uh, library's assistance with the book. And he's joined us here today as well. Now, former Assistant Secretary of State Harlan Cleveland wrote at page 217 of the book that the UN's first years since World War II were replete with why we uh, need uh, the United Nations with the capacity to act, which is a favorite statement of Stevenson and his deputy, Yost. To do so uh, with a, the demonstrated, uh, uh, which it demonstrated uh, in the Congo and the Lebanon, in Lebanon and could now also do so in Darfur. And uh, this was a proposal that uh, Ambassador Vanden Heuvel, who's also sitting here today, it's constantly urged, as well as the former Under Secretary General of, uh, the, of the United Nations, Brian Urquhart. Cleveland adds that it should continue to be done. And that, uh, after all, he says that the United Nations is not the other guys. The UN is us, he said, complicated to be sure by the fact that, the, that uh, we have to add, act in the collective interest of many as well. It seems, however, to be a lesson we have forgotten in our unilateral excursions of the past eight years, though others since Stevenson have not. We have a number of other authors in the book that are outstanding, inclusive of Dr. Arthur Schlesinger, U.S. Court of Appeals, Judge Carl McGowan, Ambassador George Bunn, who was one of the drafters of the Nonproliferation Treaty, Ambassador James Goodby, and of physicist Sidney Drell. Um, they've worked with Clinton here recently up to the beginning of the current Bush administration. Uh, there are a number of other features in the book, inclusive of the recollections of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, I mentioned that I had spoken in one of my editorial notes with uh, former Senator Eugene McCarthy, who had planned to issue a um, chapter in the book, but he then passed away, saying that in his opinion had Stevenson been uh, nominated and elected in 1960, that uh, the Vietnam War would have been avoided. I'm not going to go into all the reasons why. Cleveland's chapter talks about that. The next thing I would mention is Adele Simmons. We'll talk about the impact, which not too many people are uh, aware of, of Stevenson's leadership, of helping to create a constituency in terms of nuclear control. Uh, so I won't steal her thunder. All I can say is that constituency is very real, and we have some unfinished business in the form of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which needs ratification desperately, applies to underground testing. The other has been ratified already. And uh, it seems to those of us who have been studying this, <coughs> that that is an immediate issue. It's certainly keeping in mind that the Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed by Korea and North Korea and uh, by uh, Iran. That's something that uh, is a matter of great concern because there's some important inspection rights that are missing. 
without it. Now we are on the edge of an election where our successors to the current administration talk loosely of confronting a former Cold War adversary. By contrast, we are reminded of the care shown by Stevenson and the current, then current, Kennedy administration during the Cuba Missile Crisis in, the 19, in 1962, demanding transparency of Soviet Ambassador Zorin as to what they were, as to whether they were installing atomic-tipped missiles in nearby Cuba, yet waiting patiently, quotes, until hell freezes over, close quotes, as Stevenson put it, for their answer from Moscow while disclosing the same to exist with U-2 evidence that was allowed to be re released, and then sensitively seeking a peaceful resolution of outstanding issues without recourse to war. I quote Stevenson at page two of the book in which he says, let it be remembered not as a day when the world came to the edge of nuclear war, but the day when men resolved to let nothing thereafter stop them in their quest for peace. And the point of all of this is that is the way it worked, not the way others are apparently loosely talking about. It. I'd be interested in hearing from Jack Matlock on this when he has an opportunity to speak. And so basically in conclusion, I would say the following. A peripatetic and moral man, Stevenson knew was necessary and right to patiently collaborate in this world, not dictate to others, in order to foster an enhancement of human life and safety of uh, mankind. In an atomic world where others had or could get the bomb, obviously we had to have peace. Otherwise, sooner or later, those matters could get out of hand. Preeminent in our power, we thus needed to lead by example and assistance, using our power only as a deterrent, a lesson learned in Korea and Vietnam. See book at page 218. You can see that I have a legal background. You cite always. And so we wind up by saying that Stevenson had a deep concern for people everywhere, and it reflected itself in all of his programs, wherever he was at the time. John Bradham certainly will speak to this. We are fortunate to have had Adlai Stevenson. He is surely blessed for being the most enduring peacemaker of our time. And that is what this book and symposium are all about. Thank you, Jeffrey. So all the, uh, all the panelists will forgive me for very brief introductions, much shorter than they all deserve. Uh, but I will now um, introduce, uh, again, with brevity, Senator Stevenson. Uh, Senator uh, Adlai Stevenson uh, served as the U.S. Senator from uh, Illinois from 1970 to 1981. He is, of course, the son, one of the sons of Governor Stevenson. In Illinois, we say Governor Stevenson. Maybe in the foreign policy world, they say Ambassador Stevenson. I don't know. Uh, and also the great-grandson of Vice President Adlai Ewing Stevenson. Senator Stevenson, uh, during his tenure in Congress, was the first chairman of the Ethics Committee and principal author of the International Banking Act. Since leaving the Senate, Senator Stevenson has been active in East Asia as chairman of SCNM Investment Management Company and co-chair of the Wabme Capital Company, I think was one of the first Sino uh, U.S. investment banks. So without further ado, Senator Stevenson. Thank you, President Bienen, <clears throat> Dean Slaughter, and friends. The Gov, as he was known to <clears throat> friends, was a product of Princeton. He never forgave me for going to Harvard. He was a product of uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, enlightened internationalism. Uh, an intellectual, as uh, Dean Slaughter uh, indicated, but not, uh, like Wilson, a scholar. He was a, a peripatetic student of the world, 
forever since boyhood, um, exploring markets and favelas to learn how people lived, rummaging in ruins, battlefields, and monuments to discover their past, always listening and absorbing history. Uh, the perspective was from no ivory tower for armchair strategists and polemicists. It was from history and the real world on the ground and off in the front lines. It was devoid of ideology and dogma. The egghead was hard-boiled. <laughs> His universe was the uh, world, but the roots ran uh, deep in central Illinois. In the Black Book, which is our political uh, archive uh, preserved in part here at uh, Princeton, in which I'm converting into a, into a book uh, with comments on the implications of this recorded past over many generations now for the uh, uh, future. The Black Book records grandfather Jesse Fell proposing to, to uh, Senator Stephen A. Douglas discussions of slavery in the territories with a lawyer legislator named Abraham Lincoln. After the seven <clears throat> debates had uh, attracted Lincoln the national attention, which uh, Phil uh, expected, he persuaded Lincoln to write his uh, autobiography, which Phil then used to promote uh, uh, Lincoln for president in the East. In 1860, uh, Jesse Phil and his young law partner, <clears throat> David Davis were charged by the Republican Illinois Convention with organizing its delegation to the National Convention for Abraham Lincoln. A few years there, thereafter, they got together in Bloomington behind closed doors to administer the estate of the martyred president. Wilson was an influence, but Lincoln was an inspiration and ever a presence in this family. But it was Adlai One who got us started in politics. As first assistant postmaster general in Grover Cleveland's first administration, he replaced 40,000 Republicans with 40,000 good Democrats. <laughs> and for that uh, public service, he was rewarded by his grateful party with its nomination for vice president of the United States in 1892, uh, an office to which he was elected. 1948 was uh, shaping up to be a bad year for the Democratic Party. The Illinois Democratic uh, Organization, um, otherwise known as the machine, needed uh, strong candidates to shore up the uh, ticket. They endorsed uh, Paul H. Douglas, eminent professor of economics at the University of Chicago, and a reform member of the Chicago City Council. Now. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> for the United States Senate and for governor, an unknown New Deal bureaucrat, veteran of the state and Navy departments during World War II and its aftermath, a diplomat, an architect of the United Nations, in the heartland of American isolationism. Better to trust the spoils of the governor's office to Adlai One's grandson. Uh, then to Douglas, who was the known uh, reformer, just in case they did win. I was the driver. Day in and day out, the Gov canvassed the state, pressing the flesh at county fairs and factory gates, railing against the do-nothing Republican Congress, the corrupt Green Administration in Springfield, the flesh, the devil, and all the other enemies of the Democratic Party. At night, exhorting the patronage workers at county and ward meetings to get the people registered and out to vote the straight Democratic ticket. That was the way it was, and well into uh, my time, the straight Democratic uh, ticket. Primary elections were formalities. The Gov was elected governor by the largest margin in the history of Illinois. Up to that time, I beat him later. Um, and, uh, he carried uh, Harry Truman and our cousin Alvin Barkley to a narrow, crucial uh, uh, victory. The Gov's campaign cost $157,000, which was a lot by our standards. Scotch-Irish, the Scotch predominated. <laughs> now a seat in the Illinois, uh, uh, on the Illinois Supreme Court touches as much as four million bucks. 
The Gov uh, only had 30,000 Republicans to replace with good Democrats, one of whom assured him he'd been a lifelong Democrat ever since he received his state job. <laughs> Lawyers and other professionals, academics, good citizens, all poured into the Stevenson administration. As they had the New Deal and would the New Frontier, they didn't bear the endorsements of campaign contributors and party officials, so the legendary Richard J. Daley was something of an exception. Professor Willard DeWertz of Northwestern Law School remembers a call from the governor-elect asking him to serve as chairman of the Illinois Liquor Control uh, 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 Commission, <clears throat> to which words uh, responded, the what? I don't know anything about uh, liquor control, to which uh, the governor-elect responded, you know how to keep your hands out of other people's pockets, don't you? That's all you need to know. Words and uh, most of the others went on to serve in high places in the Kennedy and the Johnson uh, uh, administrations. Uh, Wirtz became Secretary of uh, Labor. Not one of them went on to become a lobbyist, an influence peddler, or a convict. Three governors have not been so distinguished since then, already. State government was reformed. When the glove was uh, blocked in the legislature, he took his case to the people on, uh, on the radio, and, and he won, observing once that Cleanliness was next to godliness, except in the Illinois legislature, where it was next to impossible. <laughs> like Woodrow Wilson, he was a reformer who knew how to win. Wirtz called it idealism with muscle. After an eloquent uh, welcoming address, the Gov uh, was drafted by the 1952 Democratic Convention. He entered no primaries. He started that presidential campaign with no money, no staff, no program only a sturdy band of uh, volunteers. They raised uh, do uh, dollars door to door. Um, Adele's father was one of the leaders, uh, co-chairman of the volunteers. Uh, volunteers, John Kenneth Galbraith, John Hersey, Seymour Harris, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., others gathered in Springfield to work on policies and speeches and literally until they dropped. It hadn't occurred in me until today, but in looking over that roster, I don't detect many Princetonians. <laughs> Quite a few Harbardians. <laughs> For the Gov, democracy was not a means to power, which once obtained was employed to retain it. It was an end in itself and fragile. It was a means of informing the people. Trust the people with the truth, he said, all the truth. What wins is more important than who wins. He took out half-hour blocks of time on national television for substantive, eloquent speeches to cheering partisans, and five-minute blocks of time for face-to-face -face talks with the American people. Those were the first televised uh, campaigns. When the Republicans started advertising on television, he complained that the election of a president was not a contest between Palmolive and Colgate. His life <coughs> lifelong uh, companion in arms, George Ball, then exclaimed that movie actors could someday run for president of the United States. <laughs> in losing, he won the hearts and minds of people the world over. In the campaigns and throughout the Eisenhower interregnum, with his volunteers and advisory councils, as titular leader of the Democratic Party began the strategic arms control process, supported the United Nations, aid for the third world, diplomacy as an alternative to militarism. He laid down the thematic and programmatic foundations for the new frontier and the great society. Arthur Schlesinger called President Kennedy the executor of the Stevenson Revolution. He was the U.S. representative to the United Nations when he died in 65, a few blocks from the site of our home in the war-torn London of 1945, which is a nightly watering hole for great men excitedly uh, gathered and laying the foundation for a new world order and a peace for all time. The Gov was a peacemaker, as I guess the judge mentioned. But as Premier Clemenceau observed in 1919, it's easier to wage war than make peace. War fevers are easily excited, as Alexander Hamilton warned, and as Hermann Goering once explained, that was during his Nuremberg war crimes trial. Rare is the Congressman Abraham Lincoln, who demands evidence at the Casas Bella. 
Increasingly uh, isolated with his allies, including George Ball um, and Harlan Cleveland, in the Johnson administration, the Gov uh, planned to quietly resign his post at the end of 1965, but he died before then. I think, I believe, the contributors to this book, friends, companions in arms, keen observers, all harbor a hope that in being reminded of another time in politician, it may inspire some to follow and restore American values to American politics. The International Adlai Stevenson Center on Democracy has been organized at uh, the family farm in Libertyville. It was launched in August with pol uh, political veterans recalling the process which produced America's great presidents and the candidates who once ran under de banners of a new freedom, a new deal, a fair deal, new frontier, a great society, or the new America of Adlai Stevenson. Bursts of energy and political energy and idealism. One of the Stevenson Center's first projects is expected to uh, focus on the presidential selection process. Another on media and information. How can people be empowered by truth in the information age? The center will bring uh, practitioners and scholars together from the world to address challenges to democratic systems of government and keep the legacy lasting. It would welcome opportunities to cooperate with the Woodrow Wilson School. Thank you. So I'll uh, next turn to President Bradimus. Uh, John Bradimus is President Emeritus of New York University. He served as president from 1981 to 1992. From 1955 to 1956, uh, President Bradimus uh, was the executive assistant to former Governor Adlai Stevenson. Uh, he was in charge of research uh, on issues during Stevenson's second presidential campaign. From 1959 to 1981, President Bradham has served as United States Representative in Congress from Indiana's third congressional district. The last four years as House Majority Whip, I, I certainly remember from my days here at Princeton and his great leadership and influence on matters of education, both K through 12 and higher education, of which everybody in higher education was grateful for at that time. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here at Princeton, one of the great centers of learning in our country, indeed the world. When I think of Princeton, I think of friends who graduated from this university. My Oxford University classmate, distinguished scholar of Russian history, now Librarian of Congress, James Billington, and former United States Senator Paul Sarbanes of Maryland, uh, both, wrote, uh, both wrote scholars. There's one other Princetonian I must mention. I can't tell if she's here or not. I have a cousin, Ersiliana Bradima Savopolo of Athens, Greece. Well, there she is, uh, who's a freshman here. And uh, I'm, I'm so pleased. Uh, as we're at the Woodrow Wilson uh, School, I'm reminded that my late mother, a Hoosier school teacher, uh, told me how she as a student campaigned for Wilson and recalled the, uh, the song that uh, she and her friends used to sing, Are You For Wilson? Yes, we're for Wilson. As for the subject that brings us here today, the lasting legacy of one of America's finest statesmen, Adlai Stevenson, let me explain my own connection to the governor. In 1952, while a student at uh, Oxford, on the eve of the presidential election in the U.S. that year, I joined several other Americans to put on a mock national convention at Rhodes House, where I nominated Adlai Stevenson as the candidate of the Democratic Party for president. I also wrote as a, for a student journal at Oxford an essay, Why I'm Voting Democratic in November, in which I sharply criticized the candidacy of Eisenhower, praised Stevenson, and went so far as to predict a Democratic victory. So politically intense was I, and so greatly did I admire Stevenson, that I had reprints of my article made and sent to, among others, William McCormick Blair, Jr., a Chicago attorney who was Stevenson's law partner and close associate. Only eight months after leaving uh, Oxford in the summer of 1953 and returning to South Bend, Indiana, I became the Democratic Party nominee for the election to Congress from the 3rd District in 1954. Just 26 years old, when I announced my candidacy, I won the nomination in a con contested primary. And uh, in September of 54, I attended a dinner in Indianapolis to kick off the Democratic can campaign, took a tape recorder with me, and re secured uh, endorsements for use on radio from Speaker Sam Rayburn of the House and the titular leader of the Democratic Party, the 
presidential nominee in 1952, Adlai Stevenson, who was accompanied by Bill Blair. I lost my first race for Congress with 49.5% of the total vote, a margin of some 2,000 votes to the incumbent Republican, third party candidate, the Prohibition Party candidate, can you believe it, won 700 votes. Having come so close to victory in my initial plunge, I decided naturally to run again in 50, 56. Thinking it prudent to get a little experience, I went to Washington and worked on the staff of a senator and a congressman. And then a few months later, Bill Blair telephoned me from Chicago, recalling my earlier enthusiasm for Stevenson. Blair said the governor was going to run for president again in 56 and asked me to come to Chicago to take charge of organizing volunteers for Stevenson across the country. I said I was flattered, but I don't think I'm the right person for that job. You better get somebody who'd been active in the 52 campaign and so had uh, a network of contacts. The bill agreed and said there was another position in the campaign that might interest me, and that was to be in charge of research on issues. I immediately said yes, because having been a candidate for Congress, I was familiar with framing campaign uh, issues. And South Bend is very near uh, Chicago. And beyond that, I was a fervent supporter of Stevenson. That was the most fascinating uh, and valuable experience. I had an office in the Continental Illinois Bank Building where his law offices were located, and his partners in law and politics were Blair, Willie Wirtz, uh, and uh, Newt Minow. I was with Newt Minow yesterday in New York when he talked about his uh, new book. And his daughter, Martha Minow, was my summer intern once, one summer when I was in Congress. She later became professor at the Harvard Law School where her most famous pupil was Barack Obama. In addition to developing position papers for Stevenson, I served as liaison at the direction of Bill Wirtz in Chicago and former Air Force Secretary Thomas K. Finletter in New York with Stevenson's Brain Trust, his policy advisors, a group that included such persons as Ken Galbraith, Seymour Harris, Arthur Schlesinger, Paul Samuelson, Richard Musgrave, and Joe Robb. I served on the Stevenson staff from the summer of 55 through the August 56 Democratic Convention chaired by my political godfather, Paul Butler of South Bend. At the convention, I returned to South Bend in my own campaign, after the convention, my own campaign for Congress. Yet such was the attractiveness of President Eisenhower at the top of the Republican ticket that he defeated Stevenson by a larger margin in 56 and 52. And I was also caught in the, in the Eisenhower sweep. So Stevenson and Bradamus both lost a second time. I thought, well, Bradamus, here you are. You're not yet 30 and twice defeated for Congress. You're a has-been before you get started. But it was not until my third campaign in 58, a year when Democrats won 49 new seats in the House of Representatives, I was first elected, then 10 times re-elected. In my campaign for a 12th term in 1980, I was defeated in Ronald Reagan's landslide victory over President Carter. Shortly thereafter, I was invited to become president of New York University, a position in which I served until 1992, when I became president emeritus, my present responsibility. I must say that Adlai Stevenson's example of political leadership I took as a model, one that contributed in serious fashion to my own commitments in Congress at New York University and in other positions of responsibility. Indeed, you may be interested to, to know that uh, one of my major projects now as President Emeritus of NYU is a center which bears my name for the study of the Congress of the United States as a policy-making institution. My point being that in a separation of powers system, like, unlike a parliamentary system, uh, members of the House and Senate, if they know what they're doing and the political forces at the time make action possible, can, without picking up the phone to call the White House, write the laws of the land. Here I want to congratulate the editor of the book that we meet to celebrate, Judge Alvin Liebling, on his dedicated effort without which we would not have a volume or have today's symposium. And I'm certainly honored to be participating with such a distinguished group of speakers. And if I were in the House of Representatives, I would say, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, if nothing else, this, this panel will demonstrate the great strength of networking, I think. <laughs> it may demonstrate some other things as well. So I'll now uh, call on uh, Ambassador Vanden Heuvel, uh, who served in, uh, from 1964 as Assistant uh, to U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. And in the early 1970s, uh, he was Chairman of New, York, of New York City's Board of Corrections. 
during the Carter administration. He was U.S. Permanent Representative to the European Office of the United Nations in Geneva and U.S. Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations in New York. He is founder and chair emeritus of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute. Ambassador. Thank you, President Bean. <clears throat> I was a young man about to go into the military during the Korean War into the Air Force as the 1952 presidential election began. And I was already a complete Rooseveltian, having seen the majesty and magic of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt as they led the country through the dramatic crises of the New Deal and of Second World War. So I watched closely the politics of those days and participated whenever I could. And in 1952, who was going to be the candidate to succeed Harry Truman? Truman offered the nomination or his support for the nomination to Adlai Stevenson in February of 1952. And Governor Stevenson, having won that dramatic victory and having been elevated in the country as an extraordinary democratic leader, turned it down. I don't think Truman ever forgave him for that, but nevertheless, he did turn it down. And then came the convention in Chicago. And those of us who were privileged to hear the governor speak that day, it was one of the great speeches of American political history. And it so galvanized the audience and the nation that Adlai Stevenson became the inevitable candidate of the Democratic Party in 1952. But he was a reluctant candidate. And in giving his unforgettable acceptance speech, he gave two speeches, the speech of welcome and his acceptance speech in that convention, he established himself certainly as the most eloquent and effective orator and speaker for the liberal ideals of the Democratic Party. Before joining the Air Force, I went to uh, the American Legion Convention where Governor S Stevenson spoke. Now, you have to remember he was running against Eisenhower, and he was not welcomed into the American Legion Hall with any kind of friendly applause. But he gave, again, a memorable speech, and one part of it that I remembered especially, to the astonishment of the reporters and certainly of the audience and to all of us. He quoted Shakespeare. Henry IV, Act I, Scene II, uh, where Shakespeare says, let us pluck this nettle danger from we pluck this flower safety. And of course, the American Legion audience <laughs> wondered what in God's name <laughs> had happened that someone who had come to address them on national security issues had used that particular quote. But on election day, I was then in the Air Force, I hitchhiked from uh, Scott Air Force Base in Illinois up to Springfield just to be in the ambiance of the presidential election and get a feeling for it. And I was standing in uniform in the hotel where Governor Stevenson was to come that night to receive the election returns. And Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall came in, and as they got into the elevator, Mr. Bacall, who subsequently became a good friend of mine, but then I was just in awe of this, this magnificently beautiful young woman, turned to me and said, hey, soldier, come with us. So I went up with the Mr. Bogart and, and Lauren McCall and had the privilege of being at the Governor Stevenson's uh, speech that night. I think what he said was, I'm sure the Black Book was a story from Abraham Lincoln. I'm, I'm too old to I, laugh. I feel like the little boy in the dark who stubbed his toe and said, I'm, I'm too, too old, old to laugh. Cry. I'm too old to cry, cry. And but, too but it hurts too much to laugh. And that was a statement. That's a Lincoln story. That's, that's a Lincoln story that came. So then uh, time went on in these campaigns. Governor Stevenson became very close to Eleanor Roosevelt. Let me just say in passing, I watched with some interest yesterday the president's speech to the United Nations. Almost the whole speech was directed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He never once mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt who was the principal author and architect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it brought to mind an interview that his mother, Mrs. Barbara Bush, had given to the New York Times in 1989, shortly after George Bush first became president, where she said she grew up in a household where Eleanor, Steve, Eleanor Roosevelt's name was not allowed to be mentioned. So that gave me some background for why the president may not have heard of it before as he spoke to the United Nations yesterday. But it was, uh, it, it was too bad. In any event, we, I was very active in New York politics. Eleanor Roosevelt was the leader of the reform movement. 
And Eleanor Roosevelt was certainly the most devoted fan of Adlai Stevenson that there was. And it was mutual. And it was mutual. And in 1960, as the Kennedy nomination came forward, I was a candidate for Congress in Manhattan that year. And Governor Stevenson came in and campaigned with me on three different occasions, which was wonderful because uh, with a name like mine, as John Tunney once reminded me, he says, I always admired you, Bill, so much for running for office. He says, with a name that no one can spell and no one can pronounce and with no ethnic base, to think that you would run for office in New York. I took that lesson to heart. It was right. But Governor Stevenson was terrific, and he campaigned up and down the district with me. And uh, then out in the convention, I don't think anyone will ever forget the extraordinary rally for uh, Governor Stevenson in the 1960 convention. So much of what is going on today, in fact, reminds me of those days. I think of the fight over whether or not Hillary Clinton should have been nominated and allowed her name to go before the convention. Well, Jack Kennedy wasn't assured of the nomination. He won it on the first ballot, but he certainly wasn't assured of it. But certainly nobody was going to stop the nomination of Adlai Stevenson and Mrs. Roosevelt was one of those who came up and seconded it. I think Gene McCarthy was the one who yeah, made, the nomination, okay. made the nomination for him. So uh, I was uh, subsequently close to Robert Kennedy uh, as his assistant when he was attorney general. And we often talked about Stevensonian politics because the two things I would say that are the legacy of Adlai Stevenson that really deserve to be remembered was he saved and influenced and directed and guided and gave heart and spirit to the Democratic Party. He was the only candidate, in my judgment, who, having lost an election, had a continuing and pervasive influence on the Democratic Party, not only its candidates, but on those of us who were, uh, felt that we were Democrats. He gave us the heart and the spirit to, to go on in some very dark days. And the second thing, of course, was the United Nations. But Robert Kennedy, a lot of people wanted Adlai Stevenson to be Secretary of State, and, and he undoubtedly should have been. But the President, uh, John Kennedy, is still a senator and a candidate, made a trip to Libertyville, I think. I was there. <laughs> in May 1960, I think it was. And he had gone thinking that Governor Stevenson was going to endorse him. And he left finding out that the governor was not prepared to do that yet. And in the Kennedy lexicon, that was a very difficult thing to accept. Uh, then the persistence of the Stevenson candidacy through the convention and Mrs. Roosevelt's continued support of him was something that uh, the Kennedy uh, political organization did not appreciate particularly. In any event, John Kennedy won the election by 120,000 votes out of millions and millions cast, and uh, he appointed Governor Stevenson as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations certainly the most distinguished ambassador ever appointed to the United Nations. And by the very act of his accepting that appointment, so elevated our participation in the United Nations that it made it a much more, organization, much more important organization and a much more important instrument of American foreign policy than it otherwise would have been. When you think of subsequent appointments to the UN, like John Bolton, so insulting to the very concept of the founding of the United Nations, so unacceptable in terms of the values of the United Nations representative. And you think of what Adlai Stevenson said and did. I remember lunching with him at the United Nations in 1962 before the missile crisis. <clears throat> I was in Washington at the time working with the Justice Department and uh, the, uh, Ambassador Stevenson uh, said to me that he regretted that he felt that he had been bypassed by the Kennedy leadership that he was not in the inner circle, that uh, he felt that he had been treated as a statesman and as someone who was been, had been part of the Democratic Party's past but not of its future. That was not wrong. Uh, the Kennedys knew they had to treat him with great diligence, I mean with great sensitivity. Uh, he was a powerful figure in his own right. But Mrs. Roosevelt was gone and Adlai Stevenson was the last of those who carried forward the Roosevelt Banner in such an effective and eloquent way. Then, of course, came the missile crisis and his intervention. And in those days, and I much regret it's not done today, 
The proceedings of the General uh, the Security Council were televised. So America saw that extraordinary debate on the missile crisis while the President was working in Washington trying to see how it was going to be handled with the Soviets. Natalie Stevenson had the public stage and carried the argument against the Soviet Union for what was happening. And his famous uh, his comment that the judge mentioned with uh, uh, Ambassador Zorin is remembered always. We'll wait for that information, Ambassador Zorin, until hell freezes over. Because we were going to prove that the Soviets had, in fact, put the missiles and nuclear capacity into Cuba. The United Nations uh, has now not been an effective part of UN foreign policy, I would say, probably since the days of President Carter, or certainly not as important as it had been. As a matter of fact, as much as I hope Barack Obama is going to be elected President of the United States, I have yet to hear him mention the United Nations in any of his uh, speeches uh, across the country. But Adlai Stevenson understood what the United Nations could be. He had been there at the founding of it. He understood the reasons why it was in existence. He understood the problems of nonproliferation and how the United Nations was cr crucial to that and the developing world, how crucial the United Nations was to that, and the questions of war and peace, which were fundamental in the terms of how the United States could protect its interests of the United Nations. And we've seen the tragedy of Iraq as the United States government pushed aside the United Nations and all that it represented. Well, in the United Nations, at least Stevenson is a revered and glorious memory. Uh, our hope is that we are about at a time in American history, probably closer to 1932 than 1960, where if a new president comes to power who has within his heart and soul an understanding of liberalism as Adlai Stevenson expressed it, we might yet find an American government that knows how to make the United Nations an instrument of American foreign policy which will allow the United States to be respected leader of the world. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. <laughs> now I'm going to uh, turn to Adele Simmons, who has a uh, period here at Princeton as dean, president of Hampshire College, and then president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Before I say what she's been doing a little bit more recently, I, as I look out at the room, I see old friends, even a pediatrician at one of my kids and uh, people who go back a long way, but I know Adele the longest of anybody I know in this room. I first met Adele on a beach outside of Dar es Salaam where I was having a beer. And she came up and she was working in Mauritius at the time. I think that was 1963. That's right. So that yeah. goes back a ways. Uh, we've come a long way from that beach. Maybe it was probably one of the better places we've ever been though. <laughs> So Adele is now president of Global Philanthropy Partnership, a nonprofit that works to strengthen the infrastructure to support global philanthropy. She's been a senior advisor to the World Economic Forum, editor of Global Giving Matters, and a senior associate at the Center for uh, International Studies at the University of Chicago. She's also vice chair and senior executive of Chicago Metropolis 2020, a regional planning and advocacy group started by Chicago's business leadership. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be back here and sometime over dinner I can tell you what it was like to be the first woman senior officer at Princeton <laughs> and how much things have changed and how excited I am by Princeton today. But I want to start with an election story. Um, Adlai Stevenson spent the night, the Monday night before the 1952 election at our house uh, in a suburb outside of Chicago. I was 11. The doorbell rang. I answered it. A Sun-Times reporter wanted to know what the Gov was going to have for breakfast. I went out to the kitchen, found out, came back and reported, and then went and told my parents and Stevenson what I had done. They suggested, one, I not answer the door again, and two, I not talk to any more reporters. <laughs> but the point of it all is that was the only reporter near our house that night. Think about things of, how things have changed and what the experience of running for president how different that is. Well, a bit of Princeton. Um, as you know, Adlai Stevenson entered Princeton in 1918. He had a fashionably mediocre academic record 
excelling academically was not a very popular thing to do here at that time. And his time at Princeton was slightly complicated by the fact that his mother took a house in Princeton in the fall of 1919 and stayed for three years. Now, this was a source of some embarrassment, and I'm sure Ad knows more about it than I do, but I don't think I would have thought it was a cool idea. Um, he was managing editor of the Daily Princetonian and very active in Whig Hall. He loved Princeton, came back often, and his biographers often talk about and refer to speeches that he made here. Uh, his papers are in the Firestone Library, as has been mentioned earlier, but he did specifically request that they not be in the John Foster Dulles wing. <laughs> um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about how he saw the U.S. and the world and then move into a short uh, conversation on the nuclear test ban treaty. First of all, he was smarter than any of us, but he never bullied. He had the need to know, the urge to understand, and not the arrogance of knowing it all. One of my favorite quotes is that we have to listen as well as talk. And sometimes I think that what America needs more than anything else is a hearing aid. Um, I think that and a lot of other things are true. He also said, which again is so true today, the truth is that nations cannot demonstrate a sense of purpose abroad when they have lost it at home. There is an intimate connection between the temper of our domestic leadership and the effectiveness of American influence in the world at large. If we cannot recover an aspiring, forward-looking, creative attitude to the problems of our own community, there is little hope of recovering a dynamic leadership in the world at large. It is the task of leadership to marshal our will and point the way. And we had better start soon, for time is waiting how relevant that is today. And he understood that military power was important, but not sufficient. Military power and alliances may deter war, but they are not likely to develop the means or procedures for peaceful settlement or containment of vital differences among states. Again, how true today. In 1956, in the presidential campaign, he advocated a ban on the testing to stop the further development of nuclear weapons. The stage for this uh, position in 1956 was set in 1955 in this dispute over Kimoi and Matsu, the two islands off China. We now know that five times the Joint Chiefs recommended the use of atomic weapons in the defense of these two small islands. Eisenhower vetoed the recommendations, but few ever understood how close the country came to nuclear war at that time. Dulles explicitly stated that American support for the offshore islands would require the use of atomic missiles, and Ike even later said that he could see the use of such weapons on military targets, just as he said, like you use a bullet or anything else. After these remarks, Stevenson felt he had to speak out against administration policy, and on April 1, 1955, he was clear and powerful. We will struggle against aggression, not in the battlefields of war, but in the minds of men. We will win no hearts and minds in the new Asia by uttering louder threats or brandishing bigger swords. Let us stop slandering ourselves and appear before the world once again as friends, not masters, as apostles of principle, not of power, in humility, not arrogance, as harbingers, as champions of peace, and not as harbingers of war. For our strength lies not alone in our proving grounds and our stockpiles, but in our ideals, our goals, and their universal appeal to all men who are struggling to breathe free. His talk resonated with the American public, and historian Stuart Gary Brown said that his talk provided cover for Eisenhower to resist the pressures from nationalist China and his own party, and gave Eisenhower the space to back away from military intervention. 
But it was in April 1956 that he came forward explicitly with a proposal for halting the test of nuclear weapons, of testing of hydrogen bombs, a proposal that would have cost him dearly. He, warned of the political explosive, he was warned of the political explosiveness of his position, but he believed that there was in fact no risk to the United States because if the Soviets started testing again, we could too. He said we should give prompt and earnest consideration to stopping further tests of the hydro hydrogen bomb, and I will call on other nations in the Soviet Union to follow our lead. And if they don't persist, in, if they don't and persist in further tests, we will know about it and can reconsider our policy. It did have an impact. In 1958, Eisenhower suspended nuclear testing, and the negotiations that were to last for five years began. In 1961, when Stevenson was at the UN, the Soviets did resume nuclear tests, and his response was clear. Once again, the iron fist of the Soviet Union has crushed the hopes of peace-loving peoples. And two months later, he introduced an, emerge, an, an immediate test ban treaty, pledging that the United States would devote all of its energies to the quickest possible conclusion of the negotiations to end this suicidal business before it ends us. Standing alone, the Nuclear Weapons Treaty would be an immense leap forward towards sanity. It would be an incredible gain for humanity, and it would slow down the arms race. And, as he said, above all, it would mark a great adventure for international peace. Two years passed before the actual test ban treaty was ready for signature, limiting atmospheric testing only, but even that was a step. Kennedy and Macmillan had persuaded Khrushchev to join them at the table, and on August 5th, 1963, the treaty was signed. And this was a first step. We saw later the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1970, and as Judge Liebling said, there is still hope that some have that we will have a comprehensive test ban treaty. But Stevenson also understood that nuclear testing was the work of governments, but he thought a lot about the role of governments. He basically thought that we did not need big government, we needed good government, and the art was to figure out at what level different decisions had to be made. He was also, in fact, a great advocate of free markets. I don't like any interference with free markets, free men, and free enterprise. I like the freedom to succeed and fail. But I also know, he said, that there can be no real freedom without economic justice, social justice, equality of opportunity, and a fair chance for every individual to make the most of himself. And I know that there is little the man on the assembly line or plow can do to affect the chain of events which may close his factory or foreclose his mortgage. Half a century ago, Stevenson was concerned with the growing economic disparity within the United States. It bothered him, not just because of the sheer injustice of hunger amid plenty, but also because he believed that Americans' obsessive consumerism was destructive both to ourselves and our image abroad. He said the goal of life is more than material advance. It is now and through all eternity the triumph of spirit over matter of love and liberty over force and violence. He said these words with urgency in 1952. And I guess I'm sad that they have not lost their urgency 56 years later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ambassador Matlock has been very patient. I thank him for that. He has been a career foreign uh, service officer. He served as Ronald Reagan's principal advisor on Soviet and European affairs and later as United States Ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1987 to 1991. After leaving the Foreign Service, uh, he has been a professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies across the way. I hope he still has a good kitchen, Jack. Um, he wrote an account of the end of the Soviet Union titled Autop Autopsy uh, on an Empire, followed by an account of the end of the Cold War titled Reagan and Gorbachev, How the Cold War Ended, and these books established his fine reputation as an historian. 
Professor Mann. Thank you very much. Unlike the others on the panel, I never had the opportunity to work uh, with Governor Stevenson, nor did I ever meet him personally. And yet, thinking back, I, am, I find it remarkable the degree to which his positions and his ideas, his contribution to American politics and thinking in foreign affairs and domestic affairs has affected me and my life. Rebecca and I were graduate students at Columbia when Adlai Stevenson accepted the nomination as candidate for President of the United States in 1952. And I can remember the excitement as we stood, I think it was in the lobby of a hotel where there was a black and white television set. We didn't have one in our room at the time. And thrilled as we listened to his acceptance speech. The sheer eloquence and the emotion was great. And of course, we went straight out to our local Democratic headquarters, signed up, and started pushing doorbells. Um, and yet, at later times uh, in our lives, uh, we also had indirect sort of contacts. Of course, in 1956, when he ran again, we also were strong supporters. But just um, a couple of months before the election, I went into the American Foreign Service. And I was a little worried. Now, McCarthyism had taken its toll, but had quieted down a bit by that time. But I wondered what things would be like in the administration. John Foster Dulles was Secretary of State. But I was much relieved when I was assigned to my first job. And my supervisor was wearing a little pin. It was the shape of the sole of a shoe with a hole in it. And I immediately relaxed. <laughs> we, I was working with friends. It's more than personal. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, when then Ambassador Stevenson in the UN stood and confronting Ambassador Zorin, who had complained that I'm not before an American court of law, uh, Ambassador Stevenson said, you're before the court of world opinion. And I will stand here until hell, hell freezes over uh, for your answer. Of course, Zorian had denied that the Soviet Union had placed uh, nuclear missiles on Cuba. Uh, that's what he had been instructed to do. And, of course, Ambassador de Brennan, the Soviet ambassador in Washington, had also denied it to Kennedy and Secretary of State Rusk. After the end of the Cold War, there were several conferences on this Cuban Missile Crisis. During that time, I was in Moscow and actually translated uh, Khrushchev's answers to Kennedy. So we were watching that correspondence from the Moscow. But later, as historians met with the people involved, I was at a conference when Gromyko uh, was there, and de Brennan was there, and de Brennan said how embarrassed he was because he had been instructed to tell Kennedy there were no missiles on Cuba. And Gromyko, who had been foreign minister at the time, turned to him and said, now didn't I tell you about that when we met in New York? And this is in September during the UN session, as we're going through now. And De Brenner said, no, you didn't. Well, Gromyko sort of laughed and said, well, I guess it was really a state secret then, wasn't it? Uh, Gromyko then laughed, but De Brenner didn't. Well, the fact was that you know, sometimes uh, ambassadors got misinformed. But looking back, there are other aspects of that whole uh, uh, set to over those missiles. We in Moscow, in the American embassy, were not at all worried that there was going to be a nuclear war. It was very clear to us Khrushchev wasn't planning for one. He wasn't poised for one. And it didn't make that much difference to us whether we took go out those missiles with an attack, or by more indirect means, we just wanted the U.S. to be firm. It was only later when, after the Cold War, we began to discuss these things, we found out that actually the military commanders on Cuba 
had the means of launching those missiles. We couldn't have imagined that in Moscow at the time. And if we had attacked them, some colonel could have taken out Miami. Uh, so we were much closer uh, to a confrontation than one would have thought. Um, after the, the crisis, I recall, there was a absolutely scurrilous report that, that Stevenson had been one who had recommended, of all things, removing our missiles from Turkey that were uh, directed at the Soviet Union instead of simply taking them out. Of course, this was an option that had been talked about by many people other than Stevenson and was certainly not, uh, not a sign that he was uh, soft on communism. But the fact is that the agreement, again, an aspect we did not know in the embassy, uh, the agreement was, in fact, to trade the missiles in Cuba for the ones in Turkey. But the deal was, all right, if Khrushchev would remove the missiles from Cuba and announce that publicly, we would announce publicly that we would not invade Cuba. Uh, this was after the Bay of Pigs when there had been an attempt. And we, 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 but we said by the back channel through a KGB contact, the promise was made the missiles in Turkey would be removed, but this could not be mentioned. They would be removed only if it was kept secret. And I'll have to say, Khrushchev accepted, looking as if he had been defeated, in order to solve that crisis. Whereas the Kennedy administration insisted that the exchange, which actually took place, be kept secret. We were told later, well, these were obsolete missiles, and he had actually given the order to remove them, but somebody, you know, hadn't gotten word. But it was a deal. And at that time, of course, uh, uh, Stevenson's advice was absolutely the correct one. Uh, one had to be firm, but at the same time negotiate and not simply respond uh, with military force. We've already heard about the t his contribution to the whole matter of nuclear testing. I won't go into further detail there, other than to say that I think that the ultimate result of the movement to limit and then ban nuclear testing was in fact the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which was signed in the 90s, finally signed by President Clinton, but then in 1998 rejected by the American Senate. Let me say that if there was ever a case of shooting yourself in the foot, you know, this had to be it. After all, we can make nuclear weapons without testing. A country that doesn't have it can't make nuclear weapons without testing. If we had signed that treaty and if it had come into force and it would have required others to sign, think of how much stronger our position would be today regarding North Korea or Iran. Because, you know, not absolute insurance, but much stronger. So this is an issue which is still with us today. And in a broader sense, I was very much moved, and I think it is of contemporary significance, when I read a quotation in the book from the speech that Adley Stevenson gave here at Princeton uh, just shortly before he died in London. And I think it's something we can ponder today. At this time, the only sane policy for America, in its own interest and in the wider interest of humanity, lies in the patient unspectacular, and if need be, lonely search for the interests which unite nations, for the policies which draw them together, for institutions which transcend rival national interests, for the international instruments of law and security, for the strengthening of what we have already built outside and inside the United States, for the elaboration of a changing world, for a stable and workable society. Yesterday evening, a meeting concluded in Washington of former ambassadors uh, to Russia and the Soviet Union, both Russian and American. We found ourselves in remarkable agreement about the state of relations of our two countries today. 
We are reaching something close to a crisis, and the only way that we're going to serve the interests of both countries is to do what Adlai Stevenson advised us here at Princeton in 1965. Seek our common interests and stop confronting each other. Thank you very much. I think we have a bit of time for some questions or comments from the floor. You can address them to individuals on the panel if you like. Uh, yes, and please, if you do have any, go to the, to the mic. I have, I have a question for the panel as a whole. Um, Adlai Stevenson's name has been mentioned a lot during this presidential campaign, but usually not in a favorable way. Um, Sean Wilentz, among others, have talked about Barack Obama reminding him of Adlai Stevenson, meaning as sort of an elitist egghead who's kind of out of touch with the common man. Uh, I assume you disagree with that, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Senator? <laughs> I totally disagree with that. He's been, a, uh, poor uh, Senator Obama has been a, accused of being like Adlai Stevenson. <laughs> they both are highly intelligent. They're both, they're both very articulate. As if that is such a, a rarity now that it is worthy of some comment. Um, I think from there on the you know the similarities are they're 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 very um, different human beings. Um, I don't know Senator Obama ter terribly uh, well, but I would certainly not. I do come from Illinois. I know him. Uh, nobody knows him. Uh, would call him an elitist. As for my father. He was the bane of his handlers because he loved to campaign. <laughs> and he never stopped talking to people and listening to people. Adele uh, 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 knows this. I can remember campaigning with him in 1956 once when he was running against Estes Kefauver for the nomination. That year he had to enter five primaries, I think, a total of five. Estes Kefauver was known as a man of the people. Well. And my father would work on his speeches. He was obsessed with you know, speeches, with the issues, getting it right. Uh, and in the bus, from one stop to the next, he'd be working on his speeches. Well, Kefauver had a bus too. And in between his stops, he'd go to sleep. And at one stop, he automatically got up, walked out the door, and shook the first hand. My name is Esther Skifarver, I'm running for president. It was the hand of a state trooper arresting the, 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 his bus for speeding. <laughs> he was the man of the people. But if you're running for president of the United States and you really feel strongly about the issues, you take the time to study them, to get it right, and to articulate them. And I think that it's because he took that, so, that, that responsibility so serious that he became uh, known as an elitist. But if you go back and look at the speeches, the humor you mentioned was spon totally uh, uh, spontaneous. He had nothing to hide. He could uh, afford to be spontaneous. Uh, he trusted in his mission, his uh, positions, and his, you know, his, his support. That's, uh, that's really, uh, not only an unfair commentary on my father, but it's a very unfair, it's a, it's a very sad commentary on our politics. That's the point I think is really important. It's a very sad comment on our contemporary politics. Natalie Stevenson said over and over again, I want to talk sense to the American people. That was a theme of the way he campaigned. And he constructed his speeches, and he was very much his own speechwriter in terms of substance, in such a way so that he confronted the important issues. He knew he was running against the greatest military hero of the 20th century. And he knew, therefore, that the likelihood of his beating General Eisenhower was, was not a very high one. But he nevertheless insisted upon not taking the shortcuts in politics, not giving the short answer, not giving the soundbite. He spoke to the substance of what America was confronting, 
and that's why he lives today not only in our memories, but he lives today as one of the most effective influences of the Democratic Party of the 20th century. There's another comparison which has not been made, which I, it was interesting in the book. I forget who, who the author was talking about Governor Stevenson's relationship to Illinois politics, to, to Colonel Arvey, and to others, and which, again, Barack Obama sometimes has been accused of being a product of, of Chicago machine, which he is not, uh, because both of them, you can't be in Illinois politics without having ties with, with <laughs> Illinois politicians. It's not possible and get anywhere at the same time they were neither of them could be thought of as products of local politics. It would be a really misunderstanding to think of either of them that way. It's another thing Obama is accused of a lot. I don't know if, if Senator Stevenson has a view about well, that. Well, you know, I, I was always supported by, I had six statewide runs for public office, always with the support of the regular Democratic organization. Um, I was also from the very first days in the Illinois legislature, one of the leaders of the reform movement, both in the state and at. Uh, I, it never would have occurred to anybody, I don't think, to think, accuse me or my father before me or Paul Douglas of being somehow corrupt because our old party was supporting us. And I tell you, the candidates may have been a little better in those days, uh, too. Our present governor's name is. Rod Blagojevich. He is not a candidate of the bosses. In fact, they asked me to run against him. <laughs> Henry, I would just like to ask a question. John Bradamus and I were yesterday with Newt Minow and the discussion of the presidential debate. And John, as I recall, someone said, it was either Newt Minow, that there was an offer of a debate by the League of Women Voters to Governor Stevenson in 1956, but he turned it down. Are you familiar with that? You had not heard that before either? Because he would, it seemed to me, it would have been an astonishing opportunity for him to speak to the country. Well, he was the one that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt gave credit to the, the commencement of these debates. The, the thing that strikes me when I first saw Senator Stevenson suggested putting this book together, he said, yeah, I, I think that's a pretty good idea because you hear so many references to my father. And so people are talking about it. So my, my question to you today as I, as I listen to all this, including to my relatives, why are they mentioning Adlai Stevenson so frequently? Because Adlai Stevenson stood for such great principles. And people like Karl Rove and others have to criticize that. And if Barack Obama is an intelligent man and stands for the same things, and he also will be crucified. I, I said to my cousin, uh, Adlai Stevens is such a wonderful person, we're, we're writing this book about him, and he said, well, what's so great about Adlai Stevenson? He never was elected president. Well, I thought about that, and I saw him a year later, and I said to him without any prior discussion, and I mentioned this in the book, and Moses never reached the promised land either. Adlai Stevenson stood for the right principles regardless. And uh, he had a tough time, you know. Eisenhower was a war hero of extraordinary note. It might also be said that one of the things Stevenson did was in the vice presidency, which is a subject of some interest and concern today. But in the 1956 convention, I think he's the only candidate in the history of the Democratic Party who opened up the choice of the vice presidency to the convention itself did not recommend a candidate to the convention. That was really one of the great boosts that John Kennedy got that ultimately yeah. resulted in his becoming the candidate in 1960. Because he and Estes Kefauver and I think Senator Gore locked horns in that convention and here that was the first national appearance of young John Kennedy on the scene and uh, it made him a national figure. He was better off losing the nomination. Yes. I think the answer to some of your friends, however, is um, it's an experienced one. And um, whenever we traveled with the Gov, he would get off the, we were in a boat in the Mediterranean, he would get off the boat, meet with the mayor, yeah. But then he would really talk to people all over the village. It was extraordinary. But part of your answer 
for the next five weeks is that Barack lived and worked in the south side of Chicago in a community and developed strong and close relationships that are not elitist and not um, effete in any way. He's one of these remarkable people who can be the editor of the Harvard Law Review and a community organizer on the south side of Chicago. That's truly extraordinary. I think, I think that, that, that maybe the, the main basis for this complaint is that uh, well, the, he was accused in these campaigns of talking over the heads of the people. And that made him an, uh, an elitist. He did not insult the intelligence of the people. As I tried to indicate er earlier, the campaign was not a device for winning. That's the Nixonian ethic. It's a game. Anything goes. It was a means of informing the people so they could make the right decision. And he took that as a duty, not to win, but to inform the American people, trust them with the truth, so that they could make a sound decision. And that's the leaders. And the other. Well, I thank you uh, for your patience. I thank the panelists. And as I, uh, Judge Levin said, there's a reception and a book signing outside, and we welcome you all to it. Thanks for being with us.